Well, hello everyone. Good evening and uh, welcome to a very special edition of Astronauts Live. We've got another terrific presentation planned for you. And as always, we're very excited that you chose to spend some of your time with us here tonight. Our presentation is going to be about 20 minutes in length, after which we'll be able to address hopefully a few of your questions. Uh, and now I, uh, as always, would like to introduce you to our presenter uh, for the evening, Mary McDonald. Mary is the Planetarium Programs Manager at the Framingham State University Planetarium. And I know that she's uh, anxious to get started tonight. So Mary. Thank you, Bruce. So yes, welcome to Astro Nights. And we have been doing this bi-weekly, but we decided to do a little special today because tomorrow uh, is a very special day uh, in the world of astronomy. It is the summer solstice. And you're gonna learn a little bit about what that means. And one of the main ideas of our program tonight is we're gonna be looking at a couple of places around the world in the human built environment that appear to have been built in a way to allow those people to know the exact moment when the solstice is happening. Uh, one such place uh, is right behind me in, you know, that's, that's where I am right now. I'm just hanging out here. Uh, this is the Sun Wheel at UMass Amherst, my alma mater. Go Minutemen. This was a structure that was built intentionally to illustrate how you could place objects in a certain way to highlight the position of the sun um, any day of the year, but in particular on a few special days. So this is sort of inspired by real life structures that have been found around the world that appear to have been done this way. And probably the most well-known of these is Stonehenge, which is where we find ourselves right now. And with that, um, I am going to uh, turn off my video and I'm gonna invite you all to take a look at the lovely skies over Stonehenge. All right, so you are looking at this lovely scene as it will appear tomorrow evening, or tomorrow morning, excuse me, at five o'clock a.m. local time. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, through my postings on social media that the actual real life solstice sunrise is going to be live streamed from Stonehenge tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. local time. So uh, it'll be about midnight our time uh, on Saturday night. So if you're interested in checking that out, that should be fun. But if not, we're going to be able to see uh, pretty, pretty close right here um, at Astro Nights. All right, so why Stonehenge? Well, first of all, we don't really know what Stonehenge is, what the purpose of it is. It was built, we believe, in the year 2500 BC, which means about 4,500 years ago in England, um, obviously. And the people who built Stonehenge did not have any written records. Uh, you know, we assume there was no written language in that society. So we really have no idea what the purpose of this structure was. Uh, there are clues though, and, and I wanna point out that this is the work of archeologists to look at these clues and try to figure out what was going on with the people who built these things. So the reason why there is a, an association with the summer solstice at Stonehenge is because on that day and on that day only, we're gonna turn around and see it, when the sun rises, it rises directly over this stone right here, which is known as the heel stone. 
And it really is quite lovely in some of the images that I've seen. I'm going to bring my cursor over there slowly and point it out. So there's the inner circle of the huge stones that the ones you're seeing in front. And then outside of the circle, there is this pointy stone known as the heel stone. And as you can see on the morning of the solstice, the sun rises directly over it. It also passes, uh, the sun's rays at that moment pass directly into the center of the circle of stones. And it, it does appear to be some sort of alignment. Uh, there is also archaeological evidence that Stonehenge may have been arranged in a way to celebrate the winter solstice, uh, which we will learn about later. Uh, but for some reason, the summer solstice is really, really popular with Stonehenge visitors, um, probably because the weather is just so much better. So we are going to take a look at what it looks like to watch the sun move across the sky um, at Stonehenge. So I'm going to just reload this scene. So we're facing south again. But do remember, um, remember everyone that we just a moment ago looked over at the heel stone over in the northeast, and that's where the sun was coming up. So now it is time for us to watch the sun move across the sky. And I'm going to let the sun leave a little trail. So as the sun goes by, it's going to leave a trail that shows the path that it took across the sky. And of course, because we like to get things done quickly here at Astro Nights, uh, we are speeding up time quite a bit. So there it is, the beautiful sunrise, noon, and sunset, not yet, not yet, yeah, pretty much now. Um, at Stonehenge. So we've just watched an entire day, often known as the longest day of the year. Uh, although, as I've said many times, the length of a day is still 24 hours. But I hope you all paid attention to the sunrise and sunset times. Sunrise was right around 5 a.m. and it is now uh, 9.45 p.m. and the sun does still appear to be out. So it's not that the day itself is longer, the Earth's rotation doesn't change, but the amount of that day that is in, sun, in sunlight is, is, is long. Now let's take a look at, we're gonna compare this, and this is, what the, this is what the live stream from Stonehenge can't do. We're gonna compare this to a different day of the year. So we're gonna go forward in time by three months, but we're gonna leave up that sun trail. We're going forward in time by three months, um, and you should see over here that it is now September 20th and it's 6.50 a.m. which is around the sunrise on that day. And now we're going to watch the sun move across the sky on that day. And everyone at home, uh, if you're watching this with a group of people, I want you to ask each other, what's different? What's the same? What's different? What do you notice? What are the differences that we see in the path of the sun between uh, the solstice, which is this upper path here that's still up there, and September 20th, which is this path right here. Okay, and now we're gonna go forward in time again. We're gonna go th again three months forward to uh, December. So ready? Uh, let's jump forward in time. Check the date. It's now December 21st um, and we're at sunrise again. Take a look at the time of sunrise. It's much later. So we're seeing some differences here. We're seeing some of a little bit of information about what makes the summer solstice special. So now let's watch the sun move across the sky on this date in December. Oh boy. Okay, so again, those of you at home who are together talking about this, what else do you notice? What do we notice is different about these three dates that we've just observed? Ask each other. Well, one of the things that hopefully we've noticed is that the sun reaches a higher point in the sky. It gets up higher in the sky on the summer solstice. And this is really important. Um, we can show this by, it, when we're measuring distances in the sky, 
Um, we don't use feet or meters or miles even. We measure by angles, like what angle does this object make with the, the ground? With something at the ground would be a zero angle and then something directly overhead would be 90 degrees. So you can see that on the summer solstice, uh, the sun reaches its highest point um, of at least out of these three, uh, lower three months later in March and then very low uh, much later here um, in December. Now we're gonna do this one more time. We're gonna watch th uh, three months in, in the future. So right now we're at December 21st. We're gonna go three months forward to March 21st-ish. I'm not being too super exact. So I want you all to ask each other, after this pattern that you've seen, what do we think the path of the sun is gonna look like on March 21st? And ready? Let's find out. Any of you predict that at home? The sun appears to be tracing out approximately the same path that it did on September 20th, I think was the date we had. So I hope what you see here is that this isn't a cycle that the sun just keeps going lower and lower. Eventually the cycle reverses. And now the sun is gonna, gonna be higher in the sky and higher in the sky. So in March, which is what we're at now, each day after that, the sun's gonna appear a, li at a little bit higher. At noon, each day it'll be a little bit higher. And then that, will, that trend will continue until the day of the solstice, the summer solstice. And in fact, the word um, comes from the Latin meaning to stand still, because on this day, suddenly this pattern of increasing in, in altitude each day stops, the sun stands still, and then that pattern starts reversing. So this must have been a real relief to ancient people who didn't understand as much about what was going on with the earth and the sun. They only knew what they could see in the sky. And each day, you know, if they saw the sun getting lower and lower in the sky, that must have been a real, uh, a real worry for them because the sun is life. And for these people, the sun was really what was the difference between life and death for them. So that's really why the, sol the summer solstice is such a day of celebration. And that's why we believe that the structure of Stonehenge may have been built as a place to come and mark the summer solstice and basically get the party started. And the people who like to visit Stonehenge to this day every year definitely like to see it that way. Uh, but I think we can all really see why this would have been so important to people uh, who, were, who were farmers who relied on the sun uh, for everything. Um, and I, and I think we should all we should all learn something from that. We've talked a little bit about uh, the altitude of the sun. We looked at uh, the different times of sunrise and sunset, but there is one other little element that I want to look at. And I have to tell you, I have to give a little bit of a plug for the real planetarium. Um, this in the real planetarium, this is a little bit more. Um, impressive, you get to see the whole thing at once. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn um, to the east. So we're gonna go back to the solstice, everybody, to summer, December, uh, June, June 20th. So there's our heel, uh, sun rising over the heel stone again. And we're gonna watch a little bit of, a little, just a tiny bit of the time pass. There we go. Oh, that's a nice view. And now we're gonna go to, September again. Oh, and sorry, I removed the stones. I should have warned you. That was very shocking. But yeah, the stones were in my way, so I couldn't see them anymore. It's not that easy to do that in real life. Um, anyway, but let's now watch the sun rise on uh, September 21st. And look at where, where the sunrise occurs on that day. Um, it comes up right in the east. Um, and then just for comparison, let's now go to the third date, which was December 21st, and let's watch the sun come up on that day. And there you go. So now you're seeing one more difference. And this is really what makes these things like Stonehenge and the sun wheel, that's really what makes them useful is this effect, which is that on those days, uh, on every day actually, the sun rises in a different place in the sky. We usually think of the sun rising um, in the east 
And you can see that it does generally rise in the eastern part of the sky, but it only rises truly in the east on this day, which was, if you remember, this was March. So this day is a special day. It's known as the uh, fall equinox or the autumnal equinox. And that's the day where the sun rises in the east exactly and sets in the west. And it's called the equinox, like equal, because the amount of time of the day that is sunlight is equal to the amount of time that is darkness. So 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. Um, and then you see that that's the only day that it truly rises um, in the east. Um, closer to the summer solstice, we have the sun rising in the northeast and closer to the winter solstice in December, we have the sun rising to the southeast. So you've got a lot of different effects going on here, but the, the result of all of them is that you end up getting more sunlight in June. So right now, like, I, look out your window. You're, you're watching an astronomy program, but the sun is still out. It's a little, it's a little strange. But this was a really, really, this is still important to the entire world because getting more sunlight means that we can grow more plants. Uh, huge amount of sunlight, it was an important part for any kind of society, including ours, where growing plants is important. All right, so moving along, I think we need to now move beyond um, looking at this the way the people of Stonehenge would have seen it and now we kind of have a better idea of what's going on here. So why does the sun ri rise in a different place every day? Why does it appear um, higher in the sky around the summer solstice? Well, that is because um, if anyone's ever seen a globe, and now we're going to go out to space. If anyone's ever seen a globe, you know the Earth rotates on its axis, and I have that axis drawn here, the imaginary lines between North Pole and South Pole, and those axes, axes are never straight up and down. They're always tilted. Uh, so let's take a look at what is the date that we're observing. Oh, we can see the date down at the bottom corner here. Um, this is just April, but let's go forward in time. And now we're kind of close to the summer solstice here. It's June and you can see that the North Pole, so the, the North Pole that where the axis is here is pointed towards the sun. So that tilt has the North, Northern hemisphere tilted towards the sun. And just to illustrate this, let's watch some more of the year go by. We're going really fast and see that that tilt, the direction that the earth is tilted in always stays the same. It's always tilted towards the same position in space. Um, and those of you who may have seen some of our previous Astronauts episodes, you may have heard me talk about the North Star Polaris. Well, that star is like located almost right at the point in space that the earth's axis is pointed towards, which is what makes it the North Star. But importantly, because it's always tilted the same way, we have one part of the year in December when the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. And you can really see in this view here that the northern hemisphere, uh, most of it is in darkness. So more of this, you know, because it's tilted away from the sun, uh, only a small amount of the planet is getting sunlight. And that's why the path of the sun was so short. That's why the sun was so low in the sky around that time. And that's also why the amount of time that, that is in daylight is so short. And then six months later, oh, by the way, when we get to this point right here, that's the equinox. That's the, um, the, the spring equinox in March. Uh, the, the earth is not tilted either towards or away from the sun. So that's why we have equal amounts of day and of daylight and darkness. And then finally, back to June, back to the time of the summer solstice when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. Now, of course, everything I've said for the northern hemisphere is the opposite for the southern hemisphere. So tomorrow we are actually going to be marking the winter solstice for those for our friends uh, down below. Okay, so I don't want us to take too much time um, thinking about the Earth's tilt and the seasons. You've all 
uh, been to middle school and I, I can, I have some resources on our, um, on our event page that you can take some more time to read about. But I really wanted to take an opportunity to take a look at a few other places in the world uh, where you can find similar uh, structures that may have been built to al allow their people to mark the seasons and these special days. So I'm actually really excited to share one of them that comes from the United States. So this is a structure called Casa Rinconada, and it is in the Chaco Culture National Historic Park in New Mexico, which is part of the general uh, Chaco Canyon area. It's, it's not just New Mexico, it's the four, whole Four Corners area. And this was home to a group of people known as the Ancestral Puebloans. And they built these amazing structures. This area is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site because there are so many ancient ruins there. Uh, they, they are thought to have occupied this area between uh, around 1100 to 1200 AD. Uh, so, you know, almost, uh, about 900 years ago. And what you're seeing here is a structure called a kiva. So this was a ceremonial gathering place. And I want to just say that this is also a culture that did not leave written records. So we're not completely sure about these things. But we see evidence uh, that this picture is from the summer solstice, that some of the large windows allowed the sun to pass right through them on the solstice and illuminate a particular place um, on the wall. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that's observed there. Um, there are also places where there's really, really small um, openings in the walls that allow little beams of light to fall on pictographs that have been drawn on the walls uh, that will only align in a certain way on special days such as the solstice. And probably the most famous of these is something called the Sun Dagger. So it's a really cool uh, cave design that's this beautiful spiral. And people who are older, like myself, may have actually seen pictures of the dagger in textbooks. It's a really narrow beam of light that would fall to one side um, on the solstice. The beam of light would fall right in the middle on the equinox and on the side um, for the winter solstice. And lately, you can't get a picture of this anymore because I've just, I've learned that uh, in the last few decades, the, the stones fell and so the, the sun dagger doesn't work anymore. Th this is really not super strong evidence, um, again, because we don't have written records, but uh, this was recorded by archeologists who first uh, uncovered these, these uh, designs. Now in the same area, we have an, a national, the Aztec Ruins National Historic Monument also in New Mexico and in the same general area. It has nothing to do with the, um, the Aztecs, it's misnamed. This is also uh, a site where there are structures that were built by the ancestral Puebloans. And this is a little bit more simple. Um, it just turns out that a lot of their structures are aligned in such a way that the sun would line up with their with their walls of their the the north wall of what's called their their great house it's an enormous house would directly line up with the place where the sun rose on the summer solstice so this is a bunch of people who've gathered to watch the summer solstice um, at aztec ruins so this is really common around the world to see these types of alignments and we don't, we don't really know exactly what the significance was to people, but it does show that they were definitely aware of the position of the sun and how it changed through the year. And I mean, as I've said a couple of times now, how could they not have been aware given the importance of the sun in their lives? All right, so we're gonna go to one more place and I'm excited to say that our last place we're gonna visit is also in the United States. Uh, I like that we don't have to travel all over the world. Uh, we have a lot of interesting things here. 
Uh, we're going to go to the city of Fairbanks, Alaska. I thought this would be um, our place to kind of close it out. And we're looking at pretty much the, well, this is, this is our local time, 7.30 uh, p.m. So it's not quite that time in, in Fairbanks right now. But, you know, in a few, in a few hours, this is the, what they'll be seeing. So Fairbanks, Alaska is much farther north than us. So that's a little hint. Now, the time's around 7.30. Let's let some time pass and watch the sun go down in this lovely part of the world. Okay, it's getting pretty late and the sun's still out. Uh, ooh, it's 10 o'clock, still going, still going. Oh, it's 11. Wow, it's getting pretty late. Wow, it is after midnight. I was trying to stop it at midnight, didn't quite catch it. But it's after midnight and you can probably tell from for this tree right here that the sun is still out here at midnight in Fairbanks, Alaska. And this is really common in parts of the world that are very far north uh, to have really, really late sunrises because that tilt of the sun that we saw, or tilt of the earth that we saw, obviously is gonna have a greater effect on places that are at higher latitudes, farther north, and then farther south. Um, so Fairbanks, Alaska is one of the many places in the high northern latitudes that have festivals celebrating uh, what they call the Midnight Sun. So the Midnight Sun Festival in Fairbanks is one of the most famous festivals of the solstice. Um, there's, there's, of course, local indigenous traditions, but more recently, they've become famous for having um, a baseball game every year that starts at 10 p.m. So let's let a little bit more time pass. The sun's dipped below the horizon, but it really never gets dark. And look, it's now um, about three o'clock in the morning and the sun is coming back up. So it really just never becomes night at this part of the world. Um, on the solstice. And this is most extreme at the North Pole itself, uh, which sees absolutely no, no sunset at all uh, during this time of year, and actually for several months around before and after the solstice as well. So uh, that's, that's what I'm going to end with, uh, just talking a little bit about Besides ancient structures, there are traditions, things that people do uh, to celebrate the solstice. And unsurprisingly, a lot of these traditions come from places in the far north. So I mentioned um, the festivals in Alaska, but some of the more ancient ones are in Scandinavia. Like in Sweden, they refer to it as Midsommar and Midsummer, uh, and this is where a lot of the famous spring traditions that we know about come from, like the Maypole, which is also associated with May 1st, but traditionally it's just a solstice thing. Um, one of my favorites is Latvia. They have a festival um, that is pretty much the, the stereotypical spring festival where the traditions include creating floral wreaths, lighting bonfires, singing and dancing, drinking beer, and eating a traditional solstice cheese. And obviously we've talked a lot about the importance of the sun to uh, societies that are agricultural. Uh, and in addition, just the explosion of all sorts of plants from wildflowers to fruits to vegetables, there's an association um, with, with fertility with this time of year. And so there are a lot of pagan traditions in many, many different pagan uh, religions that associate this time of year with fertility. So it is traditionally a time to cast spells uh, in order to achieve great fertility or find a spouse. And around the world, June is still one of the most popular months for wedding celebrations. So that's, that's our little trip around the world um, celebrating the solstice. I hope that you all, uh, you still have plenty of time. It's not the, exactly the solstice today, but we do have a very late, it's still almost as late as sunset today. Um, so you've got plenty of sun, sun, sun left to enjoy the rest of your evening uh, today, tomorrow, and for, for many more days. So at this point, I wanna ask um, if anyone has any questions Okay, um, so the question that I have here is a great one. 
Uh, is the sun linear at the summer solstice? Seems like the other months were parabolic. Um, that is a really great, great question. And maybe we can really quickly take a look. And I totally, I totally agree with you. But some of the other, um, some of the other viewers might not know exactly what you're talking about. So this was the path of the sun on the solstice. It certainly does look like a straight line going across the sky. Um, I'll stop it right there. And then we'll quickly take a look at another to compare. So this is, this is the September, um, the September path. And it certainly does appear that this day, the sun appears to be traveling on a parabolic path. And on the solstice, that path appears a little bit straighter. Uh, it is not a major difference. It is actually, um, it's actually that just really the effect that you are not able to see the entire path on the solstice. So, and that's an important, that's an important point because the path is longer. So the, the path that the sun has to travel on the solstice is a longer path. So right now with this view here, you're not seeing the, the end point or the beginning point. Um, there's a couple of things I could do. I could turn us a little bit to, oh gosh, no, now I've lost them. Yeah, so that's, that's, see, that's why I didn't do it this way, probably. Um, but if, if we could turn and look at them um, from the other direction, which is what I was trying to do earlier, you could see them a little bit better. So they, they are all parabolic paths, but when you only see a small amount of a parabola, uh, a large, when you see a small section of a large parabola, it's going, that section is going to appear flatter. Just like, you know, when you look at like just one little section of a basketball, it can kind of appear flat. Uh, and, and I will go ahead and say that the software that we use to do these presentations is software that was originally developed for the planetarium. So I, I really am, you know, looking forward to the day that we can have you all back in in the in-person planetarium and, and see things like this, where you can see the whole parabolic path um, all at once. Um, are there any other questions? Questions from the audience? All right, well then, um, I'm gonna say once again to everyone, please do check out our website uh, there are lots of other events coming up. Tell your friends about them. And we've got other resources available. And most importantly, everybody, get out there and enjoy the beautiful weather. Enjoy the sunshine. Uh, it really is a wonderful time of year. And I think that these traditions uh, have continued for a reason. Because who, who doesn't love a lot of sunlight? All right. So with that, I'm going to say good evening to everyone. Happy solstice, and we hope to see you at the next Astro Nights.